Hello and welcome to Ask Gummabana Tech. This is the show where we do our best to answer your mountain bike tech queries. So if you have a question of your own, don't forget to use the hashtag in the comments and hopefully we can answer it on the show. Anyway, on with this week's questions. So the first question this week is from Josh and they say, I recently changed my stock rear wheel on my Giant Rain 2020 to a Nuke Proof Horizon V2 wheel. Despite both of them being boost spacing, I still had to re-index my gears. Is this normal? Um, yeah, it's nothing really to worry about. In a perfect world, all wheels would have exactly the same spacing, but because, you know, with a say a 12 or 11 speed cassette, the, the distance between each cog is actually getting smaller and smaller. And what that means is that it only needs to be, you know, a quarter of a mil out, and you might find a little bit of ticking or an inconsistency somewhere through the transmission. Now, if you were to change, you know, within the same exact model, I would expect them to have the exact same alignment, both in terms of the drivetrain as well as the disc brake. Um, but between models, that's, that's nothing really to worry about. We used to get this a lot when um, you take a spare set of wheels up to the top for the riders um, as they were warming up, and you might find, be it because a change of conditions, you might have, some, you might have looked at the weather and put on some mud tires, or just have a spare, and in that instance, you would need to, you would double check that all the alignment, even though it was the exact same rim and same, well, same wheel, sorry, it was gonna be perfectly aligned. And they almost always were, and um, you can do it very consistently. But between different brands, different models, it's nothing really to worry about. The next question is from Mel, and they say, hi, I'm planning to install a 29er Zeb Fork 190mm travel on my 2020 Yeti SB165 with 29 inch wheel in the front. Do you think this is a good idea? Um, do I think it's a good idea? How do I feel about this? You know, it really depends. The, the, the measurement you wanna look for is your axle to crown, because that is gonna take into account the fact that the wheel is bigger as well, as I would imagine you're probably increasing the travel as well. Um, you know, you have seen people running kind of downhill forks on these bikes, but I'm pretty sure they'd be at about 180 mil. Now, Going up to 190, um, assuming you were kind of probably about the 170 mark before, is going to add a bit. Um, it's going to slacken out the bike, pitching it up additionally on a bigger wheel. You're probably going to get something that is very capable in some ways, especially in a straight line, but um, you're also going to be slackening out the seat tube, you're going to be pitching up that bottom bracket, and you're also going to be shortening the reach. So it depends what you want. I would say one or the other keeping with a 27.5 and adding some travel is a perfectly, you know, good idea, as well as maybe keeping the same axle to the crown and experimenting with a larger wheel. The problem is you, you, might be, you might be onto something great. You might be onto a very expensive experiment that goes a little bit awry. That is something I can't say. I would suggest maybe mm, measuring your axle to crown, seeing how far it is out, um, you know, 10, 15 mil, you're not going to be too much, but if you're going up literally 30 or 40 mil, when you begin to lean the bike in turns, I would imagine that's going to feel quite hmm, unstable to me. Um, but give it a go. It depends, depends how much your money's worth to you, basically. I'd say buying a brand new fork with the wrong wheel size, with too much travel, is an exp expensive experiment. But, you know, you do you. On to the next question from Josh. And he say, Hi, my forks fail to track small bumps and I've tried setting them up in many different ways. I have the 2017 RockShox Lyric, and it does not have high-speed compression adjustment, just low speed. Is this to do with me being 10, 10 stone, or is it the lack of high-speed compression adjustment? I bought the forks after watching them tracking small bumps and would really appreciate it if you guys could help me figure it out. Um, the first thing I'd do, actually, is before we get into any of the fork settings, is I'd actually undo the axle, you know, just loosen it probably two turns and then just cycle the fork before doing it back up because sometimes the fork can be slightly misaligned and that creates a large amount of stiction which then, you know, completely um, nullifies any small bump that you might be getting. Um, you know, going on to the actual kind of damper settings here, you are right, you know, high, high speed compression adjustment or high speed damping refers to shaft speed. And as you're doing those high frequency bumps, as I'm demonstrating here, blah, 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 you know, yes, that is quite a high shaft speed, but this is really important because what high speed damping is, is when it's moving, you know, 
the column of oil at a very fast rate. And what that does is it basically tends to go through um, a different damping circuit. It, 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 over, it overloads or diverts around the low speed compression damping. Um, and that's when you get, you know, shims that basically blow off. Um, so what that means is that although it is a high shaft speed, because there isn't enough oil reaching, sorry, enough oil being moved to reach that threshold, it still is affected largely by low speed compression. So I would say, you know, often low speed compression adjustment does very much, so I'm doing it again, that bah, 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 it, it, it can impede how the bike tracks along small bumps. So I'd say, look at that, try and back that off. Secondly, I would say that, um, you know, you, you, you get this because, you know, it's not always the case that uh, manufacturers such as Rockshox, Fox, Suntour, whoever, bring out a new chassis, new air spring and new damper all at the same time. They tend to kind of, you know, step things bit by bit. And what that means is that sometimes you can run between model years, the same chassis and the same damper, but a different air spring. And it's often the case, at least in my experience, that when they update the air springs is when you really find out that small bump becomes absolutely fantastic. So that's definitely worth thinking about. You know, as negative air chambers get bigger, it basically, they basically help you overcome the high amounts of preload that you have in that positive air chamber. Because although you're relatively light at 10 stone, although not, I wouldn't say featherweight by any means, you might find that if you ride quite aggressive, you have to have quite a, quite a high pressure in the fork for you know, transfers and jumping. But then you know, you're not, maybe not heavy enough to then override that preload. So maybe looking at things in the negative air chamber could really help. There are ways to do a bit of Googling. You'll find that you can remove some bits to help increase the size of that. Secondly, I would say that with the 2017 damper, they are quite easy to, to reach the shim stack. So if you take it to your local suspension tuning, hopefully you have a good one, and they can basically lighten up the tune on that quite easily, which should in turn help you achieve a, a better compression tune that's gonna suit, suit your body weight more. And I hope that helps. The next question is from Tracy, and they say, it seems over the last few years, with all the new geo, that the lines have been blurred on mountain biking categories. Oh, this is gonna get the comments going. What have you done, Tracy? Does all mountain even still exist? And what are the perimeters for defining mountain bike categories? Um, you know, I am somebody that have probably contributed towards this, knowingly or not, you know, um, because I'll always describe bikes, oh, that's an enduro bike, that's a down country bike or whatever. But for me, they're just descriptive words. I wouldn't say, you know, it's not cast in iron, oh, that's an enduro bike, yada, 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 because it's, it's, just, it's just a way to, um, to describe the bike rather than a dead set categorization. I think that the problem is that when, you know, people then want to, you know, you, you build a bike and you, you know, bike companies are there to, to make money essentially. And then they try and, um, when they, when they start to market the product, they have to then try and align it with something that the consumers are gonna be aware of. And once people establish what Enduro is and they have a bike that they would describe as Enduro, then suddenly the two meld together and people get quite skeptical and they say, oh, but that's not right. You can't just be forcing Enduro, or in this case, down country or whatever, um, ramming it down my throat. And it's kind of difficult because, you know, this is just a way to describe a bike because if we solely spoke in sometimes travel increments or, you know, geometry, etc. For you and me, who understand a lot of that and are kind of bike nerds, that's complete, we understand it completely. But you've got to look at it from the point of the person that doesn't, maybe doesn't mountain bike so much. And suddenly, you know, having categorization, even at 20 mil increments, is really going to help them. Um, and it's just going to, it's difficult because, you know, in road cycling, they welcome subcategorization. It's like, oh, aero, climbing, um, endurance models, sportif, time trial, all this sort of stuff. And it's not, I don't think it's scrutinized quite so heavily. I think people, you know, accept that you can have an endurance bike and still do a road race and it doesn't really matter. I think in, in mountain biking, we kind of do get a bit, pff, I don't know, um, adamant on, on the bike's capabilities because of a predefined word. It doesn't really make any difference. You can ride enduro trails on your trail bike and, and vice versa. It's just, um, it's just a way that is meant to help, but maybe it doesn't. I'll let you guys decide. Um, but it's not the be all and end all. And just don't take too much stock in it. It's just a descriptive word, at least in my book. Um, now we have a question from Bear, Dare Bektok. 
I thought it was Dare Buttock, but it's not. It's Dare Bektok. And they say, hey guys, short question. Cool. Uh, you'll probably get a long answer, sorry about that. I was thinking about getting some CO2 canisters since I finally began to ride tubeless. So is there a kind of canister out there that you can refill with your pump or compressor to use more than just one time? Sadly not, which is a bit of a, bit of a nuisance. Um, that's, that CO2 in there is actually in liquid form and as it turns into a gas, it's what pff, expels out of the canister and in turn inflates the tire oh so quickly. So that's not something we can do at home. You can get like booster tanks or, you know, I've got a pump at home that has a pressurized chamber which you can then inflate to 160 PSI and that will zap up a tire. But you sadly can't um, use a CO2 and then refill it, at least not to my knowledge, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, so yeah, they're kind of, for me, I am, um, they're kind of special occasions just to get me home and um, I wouldn't use them personally, um, you know, around, around in the workshop and whatnot. The next question is from Arnold, and he says, why do downhill bikes have less gears, for example, than enduro bikes? I know that the name itself suggests they are built not for going uphill, but nevertheless, there might be some situations where additional gears would be nice. Yet again, um, it's such a specific target. You know, downhill bikes are still, in my mind at least, um, built with, with the racer in mind. There is no benefit to having gears that you're not gonna use. And that becomes for a kind of a myriad of reasons. Firstly, larger cogs and a larger spread means, um, you know, a bigger discrepancy between your smallest cog and your largest means that you then have to run extra chain length, which contributes to chain slap and the risk of a chain coming off because it kind of, they build momentum, don't they? And then they're really going and, and that's when you lose a chain. Um, secondly, the smaller gaps between gears means the better the shift is under power, which is good. The smaller the gears also means the shorter cage you can run, which means more clearance. There's basically no real benefit for it. I, there is there a benefit for people like me who want a downhill bike, and then we can roll around and maybe get to the lift a bit easier or get home a bit easier? Absolutely. Um, but is there any benefit for your downhill racers? No. Um, saying that, could you put on you know, a wider spread gears, yeah. But when you're riding the bike park, would your bike probably be a bit noisier, etc. Also, yes. And I think that sometimes the parameters of which downhill bike is judged, you know, it, it does kind of box them into a corner a bit. But in terms of your downhill bikes for riding downhill with lift access trails, do they want um, a bigger range of gears? I would say probably not. Now, the last question is from McSchwalb, and they say, Hi, Doddy and Henry. I recently purchased a new frame, a common sound meter, AM29, and I want to fit a RockShox coil shock. However, there is no such option yet, as they use a very unusual shock size, a 230 I2I by 62.5 millimeter stroke. Now, my question is, if it is possible to buy the same I2I with a 65 mil stroke length, and change the amount of stroke? If yes, how can we do this? Um, well, basically, so with metric shocks, this is very, very common. A lot of bikes in this size will have a 65 mil stroke, 62.5, 60, probably 57.5 as well. And that's because it's basically simplifying it by giving larger eye to eye, this is compared to um, Imperial shocks, with better, um, well, a host of benefits, which I won't bore you with now. And basically, it's actually a really good thing for mountain biking because what it means is that a lot of bikes, for instance, like this with 160 mil travel, probably go off a 230 mil I2I. And it means that you can change shocks far easier. And yes, you might have to fine tune the stroke length using a spacer, but that's largely it. Now, if you wanted to make, I've actually made a spacer, or had a spacer made for me by Full Factory Suspension, um, which are quite local to here. And he basically just milled out a bit of nylon um, a spacer, which with a coil would actually be quite easy um, because all you'd have to do is take off the end eyelet using a, I guess, a 10 mil, I think it'd be 10 mil um, shaft clamp and you wouldn't need to rebuild it or anything like that. Drop a thread lock, pop it back on and you're good to go. And those are tools that any local tuning centre will have. Um, as for getting the spacer itself, speak to the RockShox importer, speak to a suspension tuning centre and um, I would say that probably one of those things they say they don't have in terms of the importer, but if you explain, I need an OE part, they could probably source it for you. Um, you could even, like, like I did, make one myself by, um, all you need is 
something that isn't going to foul on the spring and is that, like I said, I believe it would be a 10 mil internal diameter. Um, yeah, you, there might be a temptation to get something 3D printed or something like that. I would have reservations about how that would withstand impact. Um, and so, yeah, maybe not, because obviously that's going to be the thing that the shock bottoms out on now. So, um, yeah, I would say maybe, maybe try and get something billeted out of some kind of hard plastic or nylon. But yeah, that's it for this week's Ask GMBN Tech. Thank you very much for watching. And please don't forget to like and subscribe to help support the channel. Thanks, guys, and we'll see you next time.